now going to introduce Dr. Robin Mann. But first, I'd like to remind everybody, if you have any questions below, there is a Q&A field. Please enter your questions there, and I'll be re reading them to the session speakers at the end. With the exception of Dr. Robin Mann, our next speaker, it is the middle of the night his time, so he went ahead and sent a presentation pre-recorded, and I'll play it for you. Um, Dr. Robin is the founder of the Trade Best Practices Benchmarking Methodology, a systematic approach for effective benchmarking to identify and implement best practices. He is an expert consultant and advisor for the Asian Productivity Organization and is frequently assigned to assist national productivity organizations with developing and providing benchmarking and business excellence services. Dr. Robin Mann is chairman of the Global Benchmarking Network network which represents 23 countries and i'll now go ahead and play his video in just a moment Uh, hello, uh, Matthew. Uh, the recording is not, uh, it was not sharing the sound. Can you please share uh, it again and sh uh, click on share sound as well? Uh, where can I find share sound? You have to uh, share it again. And before sharing, uh, below you can find share sound. Okay. Oh. In the education sector. Yeah, it's already been done. Uh, first, thank you to IAQ for the invitation to presentation on benchmarking in higher education. Um, I guess I'm not an expert in edu higher educational systems and approaches, uh, although I've worked in the education sector for uh, quite a long time, 20 years, I guess. Um, but I am an expert in benchmarking and uh, done undertaken hundreds of benchmarking projects across all different industries. So that's why. I'm here today 
to educate you on benchmarking and how it can be better utilized in the education sector. My name is Dr. Robbie from the Centre for Organisational Excellence Research in New Zealand. Um, after doing a little bit of preparation work for this short presentation, um, I found lots of resources which can assist you to do benchmarking, which I'm sure you're well aware of many of these. Um, I think everybody who's listening to this presentation will be aware of, you know, the world rankings for universities, uh, various institutions that, 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 that uh, do those rankings. The one I'm showing here is the Times Higher Education um, to supplement uh, world rank rankings. And, you know, whichever institution provide these rankings, they're usually ranking across a range of different measures from looking at the, the research impact of those institutions, uh, looking at the, the quality of the teaching, uh, looking at um, the ratio of, of teachers to, to um, students, uh, looking at the costs of actually um, studying in those institutions, et cetera, et cetera. So they can provide lots of good benchmark data. Um, and there are also other websites which focus on um, particular areas that would be of interest to educational institutions like facilities management. So in the bottom right hand corner, an organization called TEFMA, and they do a lot of benchmark data for Aust Australasian uh, universities and colleges in providing data on that topic. Um, also on a national basis, there are many institutes, often some institutes which, which compile statistics. So in the UK, there's HESA, which provides statistics across all universities and colleges um, to, to compare against other institutions. So, so this data that is provided by these sort of websites and institutions is very useful because it provides benchmarks. It provides an opportunity for you to compare your organization's performance against others. So benchmark data is really useful as a strategic prioritization tool enabling you to identify, you know, where are the gaps potentially in your performance and who could you learn from, which organizations or institutions are achieving higher performance, but they don't in themselves provide really any golden nuggets of what you need to do to improve. So that's, you know, benchmarks are useful, but they're not going to provide solutions. So that's quite, quite interesting to take from this. There are other websites out there and information out there that um, do try to do that, which focuses more on best practices. Um, often these are organizations which give out awards and recognition and then try to disseminate the best practices from those organizations that have achieved that recognition. So there are awards such as the EF Excellence Award across industry, but you can see an example here where the city of Glasgow College has achieved recognition at um, the diamond level. I think they achieved stars and diamonds, and uh, it, it discusses uh, you know their bounces, which can then be learned from by other or indeed other sectors. Uh, also, there's resources which are just focused on sharing best practices, such as a resource that I administer called the BPR.fam. And you can see here in the bottom left hand corner um, an example from the Higher Colleges of Technology of their best practices, of their best practice on prof professional certification. So they ensure that all their students, all their graduates, have a professional certification in addition to their degree. Uh, to make sure they're more ready to be employed. And so they're trying to improve, I, I guess, the employability of, of their students and uh, make sure that when they arrive inside those organizations that they can ha make an immediate imp impact. So we can see there's benchmarks, there's best practices being shared that can be learned from. Uh, there's also major sort of reports like this OECD report looking at the infrastructure inside a whole country um, and saying what, what's required effective in terms of raising 
performance across a whole educational sector. So it's not just focused on individual institutions that you can learn from, it's looking at the country as a whole and what needs to be done. So there is a lot of information out there to help you learn. And what I want to describe in my presentation is the different types of benchmarking. And then for you to think about how you're going to utilize these different approaches inside your own organization. Uh, there are two main types of benchmarking from my perspective. Uh, one is called informal benchmarking and one is called formal benchmarking. I suggest if you've not been trained in how to do benchmarking, you're using informal benchmarking. And informal benchmarking is just like what I've just done there, really, to be honest. It's uh, doing a, a very sort of quick search on the internet to try and find information that might be useful to me. I'm not followed a formal approach to try and access that, that information. And I've not got a formal approach in mind of how I'm going to utilize that information. So informal benchmarking can be doing some quick desktop research, internet research, but it's also about learning from colleagues and experts. So this is informal benchmarking. If they've got expertise that they can bring to you, maybe they've worked in other educational institutions and can share that knowledge, or they've got some expertise in terms of a particular practice that could be more widely disseminated inside your organization, then that should be shared. And to facilitate learning from experts and colleagues, often networking uh, helps to achieve that. Therefore, particularly working in communities of practice, bringing people together who work in similar areas or in similar processes and sharing their experience. All this is benchmarking. It's improving your knowledge. And then hopefully you're going to put some of that knowledge into, into practice. When we look at formal benchmarking, there are two main types. One is performance benchmarking. And some people, when they talk about benchmarking, would think this is what is benchmarking. It's just performance benchmarking. It's just comparing metrics. But no, benchmarking to me is much more than that. So performance benchmarking is comparing metrics. It's doing one comparison against another. It's similar to getting access to all that those world rankings across universities around the world and comparing where your institution is on that ranking in comparison to others. It's useful to do because it shows you where you're at, but it's not providing solutions really in terms of how to improve. Um, so it's a good strategic prioritization tool to hopefully energize your people to say, look, we need to make some changes here. We need to make, make some improvements. Uh, but really, if you go the next step after performance benchmarking, it's looking at closing the gap. It's learning from organizations which hire achievers. So if you're looking at those world rankings and identifying some institutions that are performing more highly and then taking the next step and really doing a lot of research to find out, you know, why are they performing more highly in certain areas, then this becomes best practice benchmarking, the most powerful type of benchmarking there is. Uh, I'm also the founder of the trade best practice benchmarking methodology. This is why um, on this particular slide it mentions trade and I'll talk about that shortly. So just to clarify, performance benchmarking is a comparison of performance data that's been obtained from studying similar processes or activities. It is useful for identifying strengths and opportunities. Well, we have and these are just examples of metrics where you might do some performance benchmarks. OK. Let's take a breath and now let's practice benchmarking. So now we've got a similar definition for best practice benchmarking. It starts off the same way. It's saying the comparison performance data that's been obtained from studying similar processes or activities but it's more than that. It's also about identifying, adapting, and implementing the practices that produce the best performance results. So it's not just about learning best practices after comparing performance. It's also about using that knowledge, using that information of what is the best practice and actually implementing it inside your organization to produce better performance results and evaluating that you have indeed improved 
as a result of the, the, those changes that have taken place. And this is how you really drive performance and achieve often breakthrough in performance inside your organization. Uh, here's a more simple definition because I think our previous definition is correct, but it can be a bit long or wordy for many people to say. I mean, this is, this is also a very good definition. Uh, it doesn't specifically mention um, performance benchmarks, uh, comparative benchmarking, but it's sort of implicit in, in, in what it's saying here. It's saying benchmarking is learning from the experience of others, which would should be high performers, organization performing better, and applying that knowledge to improve organizational performance. In an ideal world, in an ideal organization, you'd be utilizing both informal and formal benchmarking. Uh, the better you are at informal benchmarking, the better you will be at formal benchmarking. Because informal benchmarking is widening your horizons. It's making, it's getting involved in community of practice, getting involved in networking, talking to people who've got good knowledge on how to improve practices of performance. So it's all that sort of soft sharing of information and knowledge. And then combining that with the formal systematic approach is going to deliver you with best practices that are going to really transform uh, your, your organization. So when you actually do a formal benchmarking project, you've often got to utilize all those networks and contacts of an informal benchmark. So this is why the two go hand in hand. Um, I think benchmarking is so important today as a change management tool. I apologize, everybody. I seem to have fallen out of the webinar for a moment. But um, you, you've really got to take benchmarking seriously and know what's happening, not just inside your but uh, globally so you do need uh, this benchmarking activity um, and so i would have some responsibility at a senior level to coordinate this benchmarking activity and um, in a larger institution then it would be wise to have what's called a benchmarking coordinating unit um, I would be very wary of calling it a benchmarking unit, because if you call it a benchmarking unit, then everybody will think that that particular unit does all the benchmarking for the institution and nobody needs anything. But that's not the case. The unit should just be coordinating the benchmarking activity rather than doing it itself. The people who are best at doing the benchmarking are the people who are technical competent in the areas that you wish to do the benchmarking in which can be the academic staff, which can be you know, the people who are working in facilities management, if that's the area that are of concern for your organisation, or it could be your marketing team in terms of attracting new students and trying to revitalise the website, et cetera, et cetera. So benchmarking coordinating means you just coordinate the activity and also ensures if it's coordinated in a central disseminated right across the whole organization so it's, it's 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 very important to have this at a very high level inside the organization and then from that benchmarking coordinating unit there'd be multiple benchmarking projects focusing on it focusing in on areas that you found for your benchmarks that you need to improve in to be a far better um, institution so this this is sort of activities that the benchmarking unit should be um, in, have responsibility for. Uh, they should have a strategy for encouraging informal and formal benchmarking, a system for rewarding and recognizing best practices, system for selecting and evaluating projects, training on benchmarking, 
See, everybody seems to think they know what benchmarking is and how to do it, but how many people have actually been trained in benchmarking? So there are really good benchmarking training courses which can certify you at various levels um, to, to show you've got the right competencies to do effective benchmarking projects. So we would do recommend every organization would have some certified uh, benchmarking masters or benchmarking champions. Um, so just some examples here. So my institution, the Centre for Organisational Excellence Research in New Zealand, we actually do three things. One, I have a PhD researchers doing research on business excellence and benchmarking. Uh, that's part of my work inside Massey University. I also uh, run a separate organisation called BPR.com Limited, which helps to share and disseminate best practices, not specifically in the education sector, it's across industry. But again, the education sector, if you want to become the best of the best, you should be learning outside just the education sector. Take your blinkers off, learn from the best practices from other industries. This is how you'll leapfrog the performance of organisations in the education sector. And thirdly, I uh, run COA Limited, which provides um, consultancy in, in benchmarking and, and business excellence. So um, this is the BPR.com uh, website resource. Um, actually, if you email me, if you find, find my email, I'll give you free access to the BPR.com for one month. So there we are. That's a good challenge for you to um, take note of my presentation and my email address. Um, I also run what's called the International Best Practice Competition. And this is something that I'd like you to consider. Could your institution be part of this? Does your um, university or college have any best practices? that you think are pretty good and you're confident that that stand up well against other organizations good to best practices because we run this competition just to age organizations and teams inside these organizations to share what they're good at so that everybody can learn from these good to best practices and take them back to their own organization and apply so we run this as a virtual event very easy to apply you just to written application very short and then after that, you'll give an eight minute presentation along with all the other participants. So a quick share best practices and learn from best practices from others. Please consider. Our resource of BPR so you can learn from. Great um, practice. Well, practice two. Okay. Practices um, using a seven star system. Okay, just to leave you with some of the work we're doing, just give you an idea of the depth of our work. Um, we founded what's called the Trade Best Practice Benchmarking Methodology almost 20 years ago for the New Zealand Benchmarking Club. It's then used around the world. Uh, it's, it's a systematic approach to utilising benchmarking on projects where, or initiatives where, where you need to um, elevate your, your performance. Um, so, so the methodology is generally used by pro project teams. Very simple approach, just consisting of five stages, but underneath those stages are steps. So, so it's quite a prescriptive methodology to sort of understand conceptually. And so you just follow the stages and steps, and then you'll do a very successful benchmarking tremendous financial benefits. The reason why it's successful is because it follows, you know, a good research approach, you know, like you're doing a PhD research, a very solid research approach. So if we have a look at it, it consists of five stages. The terms of reference stage is having clarity in terms of your challenge or the opportunity that you wish to address and making sure you put the appropriate resources, which is primarily the project team, 
into that into that challenge opportunity to try and find best practices and try to improve performance. So the terms of reference is 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 specifying the aim of the project, who's going to be part of the project team, who's going to be the project sponsor, um, breaking down the aim into objectives, thinking about who are going to be the stakeholders, thinking, you know, about you know, how we're going to um, manage the relationship with the stakeholders throughout the project, etc. So that's a terms of reference. The review stage is understanding the current challenge opportunity you're facing. So it's understanding it in depth. Therefore, looking at your current processes, your procedures, um, talking to your various stakeholders, making sure that everybody in your project team has the same common understanding of what the issues are. Because with that understanding, you can then identify exactly what you need to prove it. Therefore, identify which potential organizations you want to learn from. And when you go through that level of understanding for the review stage, it often, and breaking the problem down into more depth, it often opens up the chance to learn from other organizations from other industries where you get these re real breakthroughs in terms of, wow, this, this new idea is going to uh, really transform uh, what we're doing inside our own organization. So the quiet stage is learning from other organizations, which can be through reach, can be through visiting other organizations, through surveys, etc. The amount of time and effort you put into the acquire stage will be detected. Uh, once you've identified the best practices, you'll then need to deploy them and implement them, and then finally evaluate the outcomes. So the whole methodology is called trade because it's about trading information and knowledge with other organizations to improve your own performance. Um, it's never a one way, should never be a one way, one way street when you're learning from other organizations, it's always giving something back. So this is why we call it trade, because often you might want to get back to those benchmarking partners again in future to learn from them again and again. So it should always be this two way exchange of information. The reason why benchmarking is the most powerful change management tool there is, is because it, it helps to bring people together to understand what the problem is and then together takes them on a learning journey. There's a Confucius saying, which is, tell me I may forget, show me I remain, may remember, involve me and I will understand. The way that benchmarking is constructed, these systematic methodologies, is that from the very start of the project, they engage all the stakeholders who are, have a some involvement in that process or, or challenge. Yes, you'll have a project team working on the on the project in detail, but always throughout the whole project they'll be engaging these other stakeholders. So they'll all go on this learning journey to have consensus of what the problem is, have consensus on the best practices, and then have consensus on what's going to be implemented. And therefore everybody will understand why they're doing this, the importance of these best practices and implement them. Too often you set consultant in, um, or just specialists coming in saying, this is what needs to be done. And nobody understanding it, or no, no very few people inside the organization taking ownership of, of, of these practices, which could be best practices, but if they're not implemented, then they're not going to achieve what a best practice can achieve. So benchmark, to do benchmarking properly, it's involving your people, involving your stakeholders. Benchmarking projects, if you're doing them properly, will identify between 50 to 100 best practice, good ideas. Learning from other organizations. So it's combining these ideas and practices together produce net practices. These are examples of benchmarking projects I've undertaken in the last few years. I've worked a lot in recent years. I've been a lot of time in Singapore, Australasia, UK, etc. So some of these are huge projects producing transformation in institutions, making Dubai the safest place in the world to have a heart attack. So some countries like Copenhagen and Seattle, your survival rate from a heart attack is 65%. Other projects here on 
institutional problems by trying to make your institution the happiest place to work. So all whatever the project benchmarking can be applied. Um, so the methodology run in, in the United Arab Emirates. But uh, I, I think important here, what I'm trying to stress is uh, probably benchmarking after my little presentation, you can see it's a bit more than perhaps what you'd initially considered it to be. It, it's it's a lot more rigorous, it's a lot more in depth, but the, 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 the results can be f f fantastic. Um, when we do these projects in the United Arab Emirates, um, we're expecting benefits of at least 30 million US dollars for a cycle of 10 projects at a time. And so it's big financial projects, but also big other stakeholder benefits. But to do benchmarking well, you need to be trained in how to do benchmarking. That's classification schemes around there, around, around the world. Uh, this one's in the global benchmarking network and is focused on the trade methodology where you can become trained in the methodology become proficient and then become a master in a methodology and all projects were assessed independently from a seven star system as well to assess the professionalism of those benchmarking projects um, including looking at uh, the results achieved of which some are shown here I think I'm running out of my time. So what I'm going to leave you with is uh, some links here to um, actual examples of benchmarking projects being undertaken and case studies you can learn from. Um, please feel free to contact me as well. I say the office stands if you want one month free access to the BPI.com. I can give you that. So hopefully you're a bit more enlightened and look forward to you successfully applying benchmarking in the future. Good luck. Cheers. Bye.